Hi everyone, this is Grace of GB Maltese and I'm going to read one or two stories to you today. If you're looking at the screen you will see that I am working on a clock. This is a clock that I showed in one of my openings of um, baggings whatever from gbfke.com and I will try to remember to link where I purchased it where the exact location if you're interested in it it's I'm enjoying working on it of course I just started it but it's really pretty anyway I am going to the first story I'm going to read and if I have time I'll read two the first one is called why the sea is salt once upon a time long long ago there were two brothers the one rich and the other poor when christmas eve came the poor one had not a bite in the house either of meat or bread so he went to his brother and begged him in heaven's name to give him something for christmas day it was by no means the first time his brother had been forced to give some food to him, and he was no more pleased at being asked now than he generally was. If you will do what I ask you, you shall have a whole ham, said he. <clears throat> the poor one immediately thanked him and promised. Well, here is the ham, and now you must go straight to dead man's hall, said the rich brother, throwing the ham at him. Well, I will do what I have promised, said the poor man. And he took the man, he took the ham, and set off. He went on and on for the live long day, and at nightfall he came to a place where there was a bright light. I have no doubt this is the place, thought the man with the ham. An old man with a long white beard was chopping yule logs. Good evening, said the man with the ham. Good evening up to you. Where are you going at this late hour, said the old man. I am going to Dead Man's Hall, if only I am on the right track, answered the poor man. Oh, yes, you are right enough, for it is here, the old man said. When you go inside, they will all want to buy your ham, for they don't get much to eat there. But you must not sell it, unless you can get for it the hand mill which stands behind the door. When you come out again, I will teach you how to stop the hand mill, which is useful for almost everything. So the man with the ham thanked the other for his good advice, and he rapped at the door. When he went in, everything happened just as the old man had said. All the people, great and small, came around him like ants on the anthill, and each tried to outbid the other for the ham. By rights, my old woman and I should have it for our Christmas dinner, but... Since you have set your hearts upon it, I must just give it up to you, said the man. But if I sell it, I will have the hand mill standing there behind the door. At first, they would not hear of this and haggled and bargained with the man. But he stuck to what he had said, and the people were forced to give the hand mill to him. When the man returned to the yard, he asked the old woodcutter how to stop the hand mill. And when he had learned that, he thanked him and set off with all the speed he could. But he did not arrive home until after the clock had struck twelve on Christmas Eve. But where in the world have you been? asked the old woman, his wife. Here I have sat waiting for you hour after hour, and have not even two sticks to lay across each other underneath the Christmas porridge pot. Oh, I could not come before. I had something of importance to see about, and a long way to go, too. But now you shall just see, said the man. Then he set the mill on the table 
and bade it first grind light, then a tablecloth, then meat and beer and everything else that was good for a Christmas Eve supper. And the mill ground all that he had ordered. Bless me, said the old woman, as one thing after another appeared. She wanted to know where her husband had gotten the mill, but he would not tell her. Never mind where I got it. You can see it is a good one. And the water that turns it will never freeze, said the man. So he ground meat and drink and all kinds of good things to last through Christmas tide. And on the third day, he invited friends to come over for a feast. Now when the rich brother saw what there was at the banquet and in the house, he was both vexed and angry, for he grudged everything his brother had. On Christmas Eve, he was so poor he came to me, and he begs me for a trifle, and here he goes giving a feast, as if he were both a count and a king, thought he. But for heaven's sake, tell me, where did you get your riches? said he to his brother. Uh, from behind the door, said he who owned the mill, for he did not choose to satisfy his brother on that point. But later in the evening, when he had taken a drop too much, he could not refrain from telling how he had come by the hand mill. There, you see, what has brought me all my wealth? And he brought out the mill from the cupboard and made it grind first one thing and then another. When the brother saw that, he insisted on having the mill and after a great deal of persuasion, got it. But he had to give $300 for it and the poor brother was to keep it till haymaking time, for he thought, if I keep it that long, I can make it grind meat and drink that will last many a long year. During that time, the mill did not grow rusty, and when hay harvest came, the rich brother took it. But the other one had taken good care not to teach him how to stop it. It was evening when the rich man reached home, and in the morning he bade the old woman who tended his rooms and kitchen to go out and spread the hay after the mowers, for he would attend to the house himself that day. So when dinner time grew near, he set the meal on the kitchen table and said, Grind herrings and milk pudding, and do it both quickly and well. So the mill began to grind herrings and milk pudding and first all the dishes and tubs were filled and then it covered the kitchen floor. The man twisted and turned the mill and did all he could to make it stop but howsoever he turned it and screwed it the mill went on grinding and in a short time the pudding rose so high that the man was almost drowned. So he threw open the parlor door, but it was not long before the mill had ground the parlor full too, and it was with difficulty and danger that the man got through the mess of pudding and grabbed hold of the door latch. When the door was open, he did not stay long in the room, but ran out, and the herrings and pudding came after him and streamed out over both farm and field. Now the old woman, who was spreading the hay, began to think dinner was long in coming, and said to the women and the mowers, Though the master does not call us home, we may as well go. It may be he finds he is not good at making dinner, and I shall go to help him. So they began to straggle homeward, but a little way up the hill, they met the herrings and pudding, all pouring forth and winding about one over the other, and the man himself in front of the flood. Would to heaven that each of you had a hundred stomachs! Take care that you were not drowned in the pudding, he cried, as he ran by them as if mischief were at his heels, down to where his brother dwelled. Then he begged him to take the mill back again, <clears throat> and to do it, so in that instant, for said he, if it grinds one hour more, the whole district will be destroyed by herrings and pudding. <clears throat> but the brother would not take it until the other paid him another 
$300, and that he was obliged to do. Now the poor brother had both the money and the mill again. So it was not long before he had a farmhouse much finer than his brother's. But the mill ground him so much money that he covered his house with blocks of gold, and as it lay close by the seashore, it shone and glittered far out to sea. Everyone who sailed by put in to visit the rich man in the gold farmhouse, and everyone wanted to see the wonderful mill, for the report of it spread far and wide, and there was no one who had not heard tell of it. After a long, long time, there came a skipper who wished to see the mill. He asked if it could make salt. Yes, it can make salt, said he who owned it. And when the skipper heard that, he wished with all his might and main to have the mill, no matter what it cost. He thought that if he had it, he would not have to sail far away over the perilous sea for his cargo of salt. At first the owner would not hear of parting with the mill, but the skipper begged and prayed, and at last the man sold it to him for many, many thousands of dollars. When the skipper had the mill, he did not stay long, for he was afraid the man would change his mind, and he had no time to ask how he was to stop it grinding. But he went on board his ship as fast as he could. When he had gone a little way out to sea, he took the mill on deck. Grind salt and grind both quickly and well, said the skipper. So the mill began to grind salt till it spouted out like water. And when the skipper had the ship filled, he wanted to stop the mill, but whichsoever way he turned it, and howsoever he tried it, it went on grinding, and the heap of salt grew higher and higher, until at last the ship sank. There lies the mill at the bottom of the sea, and still, day by day, it grinds on, and that is why the sea is salt. And this story was written, uh, probably I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, by Peter C. Asbjornsson Asb and Jorgeny Mo, and it is in the Andrew Lang co collection. So, did you know that is how salt got in the sea? <laughs> I thought it was quite an amusing story, and it was nice to see the poor brother to come out ahead for once in his life. Okay, I have another story I want to read to you that is called The Golden Goose. And this story comes to us from... Let me... Oh, this one is from Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. So it is one of the Grimm's stories, the Grimm's, to, um, one of the stories that they told. <coughs> Excuse me. There was once a man who had three sons. The youngest of them was called Simpleton, and he was sneered and jeered at and snubbed on every possible opportunity. One day it happened that the eldest son wished to go into the forest to cut wood. And before he started out, his mother gave him a fine, rich cake and a bottle of wine, so that he might be sure not to suffer from hunger or thirst. When he reached the forest, he met a little gray old man who wished him, Good morning, he said. Do give me a piece of that cake you are carrying. And a drink. Bring me a bottle of wine. I am so hungry and thirsty. But this clever son replied, If I give you my cake and wine, I shall have none for myself. You just go your own way. And he left the little gray man standing there and went farther on into the forest. There he began to cut down a tree. But before long, he made a false stroke with his axe and cut his own arm so badly 
that he was obliged to go home and have it bound up by his mother. Then the second son went to the forest, and his mother gave him a good cake and a bottle of wine, as she had to his elder brother. He, too, met the little gray old man, who begged him for a morsel of cake and a drink of wine. But the second son spoke most sensibly also and said, Whatever I give to you, I deprive myself of. Just go your own way, will you? Not long after, his punishment overtook him. For no sooner had he struck a couple of blows with his axe than he cut his leg so badly that he had to be carried back home. Then the youngest son said, Father, let me go out and cut the wood. But his father answered, But your brothers have injured themselves. You had better not. You know nothing about it. The boy begged him so hard to be allowed to go that at last his father said, Very well, then, go. Perhaps when you have hurt yourself, you may learn to know better. His mother gave him only a very plain cake made with water and baked in the cinders and a bottle of sour beer. When he came to the forest, he too met the little gray old man who greeted him and said, Give me a piece of your cake and a drink from your bottle. I am so hungry and thirsty. The boy replied, I have just a cinder cake and some sour beer. But if you care to have that, let us sit down and eat. So they sat down. And when the boy brought out his cake, he found it had turned into a fine, rich loaf and the sour beer into excellent wine. Then they ate and drank all they wanted. When they had finished eating, the little gray man said, Now, I will bring you luck, because you have a kind heart and are willing to share what you have with others. There stands an old tree. Cut it down, and among its roots you'll find something. With that, the little man took his leave. Then the boy began at once to hew down the tree, and when it fell, he found among its roots a goose whose feathers were all of pure gold. He lifted it out and carried it off. He took it with him to an inn where he meant to spend the night. Now the landlord of the inn had three daughters, and when they saw the goose, they were filled with curiosity about this wonderful bird, and each longed to have one of its golden feathers. The eldest said to herself, to herself, No doubt I shall soon find a good opportunity to pluck out one of its feathers. And the first time Simpleton happened to leave the room, she caught hold of the goose by its wing. But lo and behold, her fingers seemed to stick fast to the goose, and she could not take her hand away. Soon afterward, the second daughter came in and thought to pluck a golden feather for herself, too. But hardly had she touched her sister than she stuck fast as well. At last, the third sister came with the same intention, but the other two cried out, Keep off! For heaven's sake, keep off! The youngest sister could not imagine why she was to keep off and thought, Hmm, if they are both there, why should I not be there too? So she sprang toward them, but no sooner had she touched one of them then she stuck fast to her, too. And they all three had to spend the night with the goose. Next morning, the boy tucked the goose under his arm and went off, without in the least troubling himself about the three girls who were hanging on to it. They just had to run right after him, right or left, as best as they could. In the middle of a the field, they met the parson, 
And when he saw this procession, he cried, For shame, you bold girls! What do you mean by running after a young fellow through the fields like that? And with that, he caught the youngest girl by the arm to draw her away. But directly he touched her, he stuck on and had to run along with the rest. Not long afterward, the town clerk came that way and was much surprised to see the parson following the footsteps of the three girls. Well, where is your reverence going so fast? cried he. And he ran after him, grabbed his coat, and hung on to it himself. As the five of them trotted along in this fashion, one after the other, two peasants were coming from their work with their hoes. On seeing them, the parson called out and begged them to come and rescue him and the clerk. But no sooner did the first one touch the clerk than they were stuck too. And so there were seven of them running after Simpleton and his goose. After a time, they came to a town where a king reigned, whose daughter was so serious and solemn that no one could ever manage to make her laugh. So the king had decreed that whoever could succeed in making her laugh could marry her. When Simpleton heard this, he marched before the princess with his goose and its appendages, and as soon as she saw these seven people continually running after each other, she burst out laughing <laughs> and could not stop herself. Then he claimed her as his bride, but the king, who did not much fancy him as a son-in-law, made all sorts of objections and told him he must first find a man who could drink up a whole cellar full of wine. Simpleton bethought him of a little gray old man who could, he felt sure, help him. So he went off to the forest and on the very spot where he had cut down the tree, he saw a man with a most dismal expression on his face. He asked the man what he was taking so much to heart and the man answered, I don't know how I am ever to quench this terrible thirst I am suffering from. Cold water doesn't suit me at all. To be sure, I've emptied a whole barrel of wine. What is, what is one drop on a hot stone? I think I can help you, said the boy. Come with me, and you shall drink to your heart's content. So he took him to the king's cellar, and the man sat down before the huge casks and drank and drank till he had drunk up the whole contents of the cellar before the day closed. Then Simpleton asked once more for his bride, but the king felt vexed at the idea of a stupid fellow whom people called Simpleton carrying off his daughter, and he began to make fresh conditions. He required Simpleton to find a man who could eat a mountain of bread. The boy did not wait to consider long, but went straight off to the forest, and there, on the same spot, sat a man who was drawing in a strap as tightly as he could around his body, and making a most woeful face the while. Said he, I've eaten up a whole oven full of loaves, but what's the good of that to anyone who is as hungry as I am? I declare my stomach feels quite empty, and I must draw my belt tight if I'm not to die of starvation. Simpleton was delighted and said, Get up and come with me, and you shall have plenty to eat. And he brought him to the king's court. Now the king had given orders to have all the flour in his kingdom brought together and to have a huge mountain baked of it. But the man from the wood 
just took up his stand before the mountain and began to eat. And in one day, it had all vanished. For the third time, Simpleton asked for his bride, but again, the king tried to make some evasion and demanded a ship which could sail on land or water. When you are sailing in such a ship, said he, you shall have my daughter without further delay. Again, the boy started off to the forest, and there he found the little gray old man with whom he had shared his cake, and who said, I have eaten, and I have drunk for you, and now I will give you the ship. I have done all these things for you, because you were kind and merciful to me. Then he gave him a ship, which could sail on land or water, and the when the king saw it, he felt he could no longer refuse him his daughter. So they celebrated the wedding with great rejoicings. And after the king's death, Simpleton succeeded to the kingdom and lived happily with his wife for many, many years. Okay, so which story did you like the best? The one of the sea how being salt or of the golden goose? I, I think I like both of them uh, in, in different ways. I really, in the last one, I thought it was kind of interesting how the two older brothers were such jerks and wouldn't share their meal with a poor old man. And then here comes the young one, and he, he knows that he's got, you know, the worst of the meal. Can you imagine a mother doing that to her children? Giving one just ooh, the worst of the worst to eat. Here's you some bread made out of flour and water that I just threw into the ashes. Eat it. And sour beer. <sighs> just thought of that. Mm. Anyway, he had a kind heart, helped the old man, and he was very richly rewarded. I can just, in my mind, see him carrying this golden goose. <laughs> And these people hanging on and just running around like crazy. They had to go wherever he went. That would be quite a sight to see. Anyway, the king was kind of a jerk. Just because his name was Simpleton did not mean he was a simpleton. But I guess the king thought differently. And he ended up with it all at the end. And in the other story, the, the poor brother ended up with all he could ever want. So, tell me, what did you think about the stories? Had you heard those stories before? I had not. <laughs> they were new to me. So, I hope you're having a wonderful day, evening, night, whatever it might be. Take care of yourselves, guys. God bless you. And remember, I love you and take care. Bye.